Welcome. This will be a screencast of using Audacity to measure the resonant frequencies of guitar bodies. Uh, you can find Audacity by Googling it. It should take you to here, webaudacityteam.org, and you'll download the current version. I'm using 2.11, and it, you can install it for Windows, Mac, or Linux. After you have it downloaded and installed, uh, before you start it up, you want to make sure your USB microphone is plugged in and recognized by the computer, uh, if you're using a USB mic. Uh, then you're ready to start Audacity. And a note on my screencast, I'm working in a window that's 720 by 1280, and that's simply because it shows up better on YouTube. The fonts are larger and the uh, icons. But your window, assuming you have a big monitor, will be quite a bit bigger than this one. Also on the screencast, the mouse you see has a little yellow uh, ring. And when I click the mouse, it'll probably have a blue ring. Uh, so that shows you when the click occurs. So um, we want to configure Audacity. So let's go to the Edit menu, go to Preferences. And these are the things that I'd recommend setting. Under Devices, uh, here's where you'll set your microphone. So device, uh, that's the USB mic that I'm using. Uh, if it's a stereo mic, I'd recommend just going to mono so the, um, the files are smaller. Under the recording menu, I would recommend unchecking the overdub uh, box because that can um, interfere later on. And in quality, uh, the 11 kilohertz setting is very good. Uh, that's what Trevor Gore recommends as well. Uh, for Audacity, 8000 has a slight advantage in terms of the window size later on, but um, either one of those will be fine. 16 would work as well, but um, not so good for Audacity. So I'll use 11 and then say OK to save those. Okay, you notice that in this window, uh, you can actually set those as well. Here's the sampling frequency. Here's the microphone, or you can set most of them. Uh, there's the mono. And the speaker volume is right there if you uh, find that it's playing back and you don't want it to play back. You want to use a reasonably good uh, microphone. Uh, the USB mics are nice because you don't have to depend on the computer's sound card for its quality. I have found the built-in laptop mics tend to not be uh, so good and actually can uh, change some of the frequencies. So in terms of placement, um, and I should say on all of this that I'm, I not consider myself an expert on this, but I'll show you what I do and um, you're welcome to follow it or do something different. Uh, the microphone distance from the guitar, uh, you want it to be reasonably close so it primarily picks up the guitar as opposed to some room resonance, uh, but you don't want it to be such that the microphone is too near the sound hole because uh, that can interfere with the air resonance. So I usually have my mic about a foot away from the body, and the height of the body relative to the mic will make a difference in the uh, relative amplitudes. I'll, I rest my guitar on my knee simply out of convenience, um, and so it tends to pick up the air resonance uh, loudest. If you're doing a lot of testing, I recommend damping the strings with something, just uh, cloth or paper towel, uh, to put in there. And you want the top and the back to be free to resonate. And I have it lightly resting on my knee, um, and I'm just holding it gently at the top. If I'm just doing a quick test and uh, you don't want to put that in, you can also damp the strings with your fingers. Uh, but if you're doing a lot of testing, it's definitely nice to not have to do that. So hammer options. Um, your first option is your finger. Uh, assuming you have a relatively relaxed and supple finger and that you can hit something and get a nice response. Um, if your hand is too stiff, some people I notice tap and they don't, um, if their hand is too tight and it doesn't allow the higher frequencies to ring. So in that case, um, one step uh, a little bit stiffer and uh, perhaps better, but it depends what you're trying to go for, is just a rubber eraser. Uh, this will excite a few more of the high frequencies. And a step above that would be like a wood stick. Uh, and that'll 
that'll definitely excite more of the high frequencies. Although I find um, a wood stick will have its own resonant frequency, just that itself. And so that can throw a little extra peak in, which can be confusing if uh, you don't know what it is. I use my finger because it um, I've calibrated against other sticks and such, and um, I get the same numbers for the frequencies. And I always have my finger with me, so I don't have to carry something around. I do use an eraser for uh, when I'm trying to tease out a cross dipole, which is a higher frequency, because uh, it will excite that a little bit better. So I think we're ready to take a recording. Uh, once I start the recording, I can't talk, of course, because that'll interfere. So let me say what I'm going to do. We're going to tap across the saddle. Uh, it doesn't, in my experience, matter whether you tap on the saddle, the bridge pins, or the tail of the bridge. Uh, you'll get pretty much the same uh, frequencies. and Let's see, you're going to do 8 to 10 taps. Uh, you want to space the taps apart by a reasonable amount of time. So uh, I would suggest a minimum of about a half second in between each tap. Uh, strictly speaking, ideally it would be one tap every 1.5 seconds for the settings that we're going to do. But I found that the results are uh, the same as long as you don't tap faster than about two taps a second. And I think we're ready to start. So we'll click the uh, record icon. And now we'll start uh, tapping. And we'll hit the stop icon. So that was 10 taps. Some things to check. You can see that my um, the mic level that control is right here, recording volume, 0.39. So if I had it too high, um, we'd be saturating things. Curiously, I haven't found much difference, if any, uh, in the results in terms of frequencies. You can change the time scale uh, with these little pluses and minuses. These are very convenient. So I can zoom out there uh, so I don't have to select quite so much. And particularly for long tests that go across the screen, that little minus sign is very helpful. Okay, so I think we're ready to select this data. So I'm going to use the mouse to select the taps that I just did. And then we're going to go to the Analyze menu, go down to Plot Spectrum, and there is our first spectrum. Okay, so I'm going to take this, take the window and make it wider. And I'm going to move this out of the way. Let's put that down for a second. So some things to configure in the plot spectrum. Uh, first, we have the size of the FFT. So this number, 4,000 is probably the minimum, I would suggest. 8,000 is good. 16,000 is good. Uh, these are too much, and we'll look at why that's true later. So I'll leave it on 16. That's the same setting Trevor Gore uses, and it works very well. The spectrum and the handing window, uh, that should be preset for you, and those are fine. For the axis, I like the log frequency. One of the limitations of Audacity is currently we can't set the minimum and maximum displayed frequency. And so we're going to be interested in the range between about 80 hertz and up to four or 500 hertz. So with the log frequency, uh, I get about two inches or so of that. If I go linear, then that interesting range is confined to about an inch. So that's the only reason why I prefer log, just so I can see the data better. You can also check or uncheck the grid lines, depending on what you prefer. Uh, now notice the peak frequency here of 5,000. Uh, that is related directly to our sampling frequency. You can see this is 5,500 for the maximum there, and that's exactly half the sampling frequency, and that's a mathematical relationship uh, that it has to come out that way. The, uh, so that's an argument uh, for Audacity currently. If you chose an 8,000 uh, hertz sampling, you get a little more display. But if you chose something very high, you can see it's going to crowd your interesting range into a small package. So that's why you, there's, um, you don't want to go too high. Now, assuming you have a big monitor, we can make this window even wider. So I'm going to do that so we can really see what we're interested in. I'll just show 500 hertz there. So that's visible. 
Uh, you'll notice that in the graph there's a little bit of a artifact. You can see you can see this periodic um, amplitude that's showing up in the waveform down here, and that's because I'm tapping very slightly faster than its preferred frequency, um, the tapping frequency of about at one tap every one and a half seconds for these particular settings, for the setting of size 16,000 and uh, project rate or sampling frequency of 11,000. Uh, this is acceptable. It won't throw off your data, but um, if I were to change the size, I'll show you to 65,000. Now these are very pronounced, and in particular, um, they can give you multiple peaks uh, where there's um, apparently just one. And so uh, that's why too high of a size is not such a good idea, because it can be hard uh, just uh, pragmatically to decide what the peak frequency is. So 8,000, a little bit smoother. You can see that those disappear uh, when we're at 8,000. Uh, so 8 or 16 are both perfectly fine. Uh, you end up getting the same frequencies. I guess I should show you that. So here's our first main peak. And so none of this stuff down here is um, of importance that I understand at least. So our top peak is right here. This is the main air frequency. And you can see that Audacity will show you that frequency in this peak window. It kind of magnetizes onto it. So that's 96 hertz. Our next main peak is right here. Uh, this is the main top frequency for that particular guitar, and that's 169. And our next peak after that is at 204, and then one soon after it at 216. And for this particular guitar, those are the back frequencies, or I should say two of the lowest back frequencies. And as I understand it, the most important back frequencies is the one that is the lowest. Now, if you're, if you're um, just coming up to a random guitar, you can't automatically assume that the second peak is the top. It could be a back peak, and this could be a top peak. That would be called an inversion. It's not very common. It's when you have a very flexible back. Uh, it doesn't sound very good in my experience. I've only seen a few guitars with it, uh, but it, there are ways that we can tease out and make sure that this is a top and that that's a back, and we'll show those in a bit. There are also some other frequencies um, above here. So I've got a peak at around 245 and then one at 280. In my experience, these tend to be various back frequencies. Uh, the next high one here at 360 uh, and there, this is probably the long dipole. The cross dipole is probably buried. Um, I'll show you how to find that, or at least a, a good approximation method of finding it in a, a later on in this video as well. So now let's try uh, a similar test, but with the back of the guitar facing the microphone instead of the top. So I'm going to move this down out of the way. We can make this window smaller by clicking that little up arrow and uh, then I'll bring this back up just right to there. Uh, first, I want to unselect the um, portion that I've already selected. And you can do that either by clicking anywhere here near the zero, or you can hit the home key. That will bring the cursor back to zero and start the next recording right at zero. If you left that selected, then it would only record that length of time. So if you're mic in the back, you could be tapping on the back, in various places. You could also be tapping on the saddle or the bridge again, and they do give you a little bit different results. So I'm gonna do the saddle in this case, and I'll do the same kind of taps, uh, but we'll be miking directly off the back. Okay, and a little bit twisted, so I'm not quite as effective as uh, I was at delivering clean taps there. Let's see how they look. Um, not too bad. Not as even, but um, they won't affect the peak frequencies in my experience. Uh, let's see. Let me bring that a little higher, and then we'll pull this in. Okay, so what we want to now look for is when I do a replot, which is this button, um, if these are back frequencies, 
they should go way up in amplitude. So let's see what happens. And sure enough, the back one went up. This top is still high, um, but the back is much higher relative to the top than it was in this one. You can see here, big difference between top and back. When I select miking off the back, we see um, little difference between the two. So the this frequency went up much higher relative to where it was before. So that gives you uh, very good confidence that that is indeed a back frequency. Now, if you want more confidence, we're going to need to tap directly on the back because that will, of course, excite that mode more than a top mode. So let's do that next. Okay, so move this down. And I'm going to unselect this by clicking. I'm going to hit the Home key, start at the beginning. Um, ready there. So I just clicked um, or tapped in a variety of places around the center of the back. There are different strategies you could do to, uh, for, as far as where to tap to try to tease things out. But let's see now what happens to the relative heights of these. We should see the main air go way down, the top go way down, because we're not exciting those as much. But we should see these all of these frequencies between 200 and 300 go way up. Yeah. So that gives you a lot of confidence that that's a back frequency, that's a back frequency, that is, and probably that one too. Now just because we see these the, um, by tapping on the back, that doesn't mean that they will all be necessarily excited by the strings. Uh, remember, we tapped on the back, which is an artificial thing to do. So the ones that are interesting are the ones that actually show up when we tap the top. That was that second one. So you see the main back there. And then uh, they fall away quickly. That could be because I was using my finger. Um, if I wanted a uh, to retest it, I'd probably use an eraser, uh, a stiff eraser, to try to get more high frequency content in that. You might be wondering, do, does the method of tapping or the uh, the side you mic off of make a difference in the peak frequencies? Uh, not really. So in this middle one, we have a peak at 96. That was the same as before. Uh, 169, same as before. And 205, I think that was the same as before. Maybe it was 204. Uh, when we tapped on the back directly, let's replot that one. So the amplitudes are different, but we 97, so within one hertz. Uh, 170 within one hertz. And 204 within one hertz. So uh, briefly, um, let's talk about some problems or technical issues. Uh, one of them is if you tap too quickly, uh, you'll get this an amplification of this artifact. You see this um, uh, periodicness uh, of the FFT graphs. So let me cancel all these out, and I'll do a set of fast taps to see what the problem is there. So. so 15 taps. So there's a, plenty of data there. But when I do the plot spectrum, so when I replot, you can see you get a lot of noise uh, here. And if your eye is very good, then you can still get the same peak frequency, 96. But I find this is a good example. Um, it'll break that main top frequency into two, one at 168 and another peak at 170. So a little annoying. Um, a way to get around that, if you prefer to tap fast, uh, is simply reduce the size of the FFT. If you go down to 4,000, now everything is smooth, and we get the same peaks, 96, 169, and 204. And that's typically my experience, uh, that uh, even at 4,000, uh, you'll still get uh, the same numbers. If you start going lower than that, that's like go to 256. Well, now the peaks are so indistinct that we can't tell. Uh, 1000, we might see a little variation. Uh, 95, 167, 209. So you can see things are starting to move around there. 
Uh, but assuming you're sampling at around 11,000, then um, if you have 4,000 or more points in your FFT for the size, uh, between 4 and 16,000, those should all be good choices. And the lower the size, the smoother the graph, but the less distinct the peaks. And a few more things to round out this video. Uh, first is that I, of course, record all my data in a running spreadsheet. So this is the main air frequencies. Here's the main top frequencies and the main back frequencies. Those are all with open sound hole. This kind of a tracking is very helpful for two reasons. First, uh, before I built many guitars at all, um, I, made, I built a few and then realized I needed to learn more, of course. And so I went to every store I could find and tapped any guitar that they were willing to let me tap. So I recorded that kind of data. But before I actually took the recordings, I made some notes about um, how the guitar sounded to me so that the numbers that I got did not influence what I wrote. And then I tried to correlate the guitars I sounded that I thought sounded best, um, for instance, these two, uh, with the kinds of frequencies they were achieving. So that was helpful guidance for me. Of course, that won't necessarily work uh, for every building style uh, for the ideal frequencies, but at least it's uh, giving you a good target. The second way this kind of a process is helpful is when I'm taking a guitar and taking it from its built state to its final state. And so this is the brace shaving phase. So I'll take the initial, uh, so first I'll, I'll string it up and play it, uh, let it, you know, wait for it a, a day or two, um, and then take the frequencies. Uh, then I will go with some progressive steps. So whatever you think is a reasonable step. So here's 10 thousandths of an inch of thinning on the lower bout. So I will play it first and then I will take the numbers, uh, maybe wait a certain amount of time, do similar kind of things. Then you can, st I started more shaving, play it first, take the numbers. And I keep working through this process and I try to note what change really did make a difference. And uh, early on in my process, I shaved too much, of course, and the frequencies got too low. And we get down to the 80s here. And uh, then you lose definition and it gets to sounding tubby. But those are good lessons uh, to learn. Uh, the second thing is that if you want to make a suggestion to Audacity, you can do that. And they take feature requests and they do act on them when they get enough votes. So um, it's in our interest to vote. So the, in the plot spectrum, I think the thing that we would all like is to be able to adjust those uh, frequency bands. So it's not displaying it from zero to 5,000 hertz, but we could define a zone. And this is, uh, they have votes on this already, um, so far 11, and different ways to do it. I don't care which one we do. Uh, and to to set your vote, you'd either have to be a user um, logging into their site, or the easy way is go to their email address. And I'll put these links on the YouTube uh, page. Email them and just tell them that you would like to see, uh, you would like to vote for these features and any others that you see. And so that point, uh, let's wrap this video up. And like I said, I hope to make another one on some other techniques, uh, finding dipoles, and some technical issues and things that go wrong.